the recordings in progress according to the uh the lady on the on on the recording so uh it's good afternoon good afternoon everybody <clears throat> welcome to a second summit webinar on um uh, covid aerosol spreading ventilation and uh, managing uh, the transmission of covid in uh, public spaces, can I say that, which would be restaurants, uh, shops, um, and the workspace offices. So today is a follow on from the uh, previous webinar we had, and we're going to be talking about ventilation, and also some other aspects, we're going to touch on UVC, ultraviolet uh, light um, appliances that are seem to be coming into the market. Uh, whether they're whether they're effective um, and whether we should be using them. And once again, it's a pleasure to be able to welcome the Green Flag Association. Uh, <coughs> we've got Sean Sean Chester, the CEO. We've got uh, Dr. Greg Q, who's an occupational medicine uh, specialist. We've got uh, Robert Randolph, who's up in the uh, uh, Drakensberg area as an environmental consultant. And um, the format we're going to use is we're going to look first at ventilation. Uh, then we're going to look at UVC uh, as um, applications. We're going to look at uh, CO2, why CO2, uh, why we should be measuring it and uh, what it's about. And then we're going to have a look at um, um, some of the um, uh, products that are being still used. So we're going to talk about fogging. We're going to talk about sanitizing in the air uh, and basically everything to do with ventilation in the workspace, uh, as is the current thinking. And um, I think that um, I heard, listened to Howard Feltman, uh, who's on his uh, weekly podcast, and he was talking to doctor, his doctor, Anton Myberg, um, and they were talking about uh, the spread of, of COVID and what they should be looking at. And um, the impression I got is that uh, the main thing now is the airborne transmission of, of COVID. Uh, should you be sanitizing surfaces? And the answer is yes, you should still be sanitizing surfaces. But at the end of the day, the sanitizing of your, ve of your vegetable packaging coming from the grocer or the packaging from the grocer and uh, the surfaces that you're sanitizing are still important, but uh, not to be discounted. But really what we're talking about is this aerosol or air, airborne transmission of COVID um, and its importance uh, in our lives. So um, one of the things they came out on is wearing masks. They cannot overemphasize how important it is to wear masks, but also uh, tied to that is uh, ventilation. So let's get on with it. Um, and uh, what we're going to start off with is, um, if I've got it right, is ventilation. We're going to talk ventilation, Robert, and you're going to do that, and then you're going to hand over to Greg, and we're going to talk about UVC uh, products um, and systems. Now, um, there is a chat. There is question and answers. We'll pick up on those, um, and, and uh, we'll answer the questions as and when we can. And as in the past, the reason for this uh, webinar is the interest shown at the last webinar um, so we've, um, that's what we're doing is we're carrying on and, um, we, we will respond to you, uh, the participants with your questions. Um, and, uh, if there are questions that we can't answer in the webinar, we will certainly, uh, bring them up and they will be answered on the, on our website. Uh, we've got the green flag association with us. We're very, uh, very pleased to be able to have them with us, and uh, so we, we're supporting them, and they're supporting us um, in trying to manage uh, COVID in, in South Africa. So, uh, Robert, can we hand over to you and uh, take it away with, uh, with, with the update on ventilation? There we go. Uh, and just before Robert starts, anything we say um, is current. It's our opinions. And um, as has been seen in the last year, things change and they keep changing. So, but I think together with SAFMA and the green flag, we'll stay, we'll stay up and we'll always be current. Robert, that's over to you. 
Cool. Thank you very much, John. And um, uh, hopefully, is, is, is my audio coming through okay? Your audio is uh, clear, yes, and I can see your presentation. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, should I say. It's uh, just after 12 to everybody, and thanks for joining in. Um, hopefully, you'll find my uh, presentation interesting. I believe it is quite interesting. Um, and there's an important <laughs> message um, that I go through in the very beginning. But what I've done is I've, I've, I've looked at a ventilation point of view, and I've made it a lot more simple um, than before and, and hopefully uh, user-friendly and easily implementable. All right, so without further ado, let me get going. Um, all right. uh, Robert, Robert, can you please switch on your camera? Sure. There all we right. go. Yeah, what a okay. very, very, very smart, very smart portal. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like to give the impression I'm on my yacht in the Mediterranean somewhere. I wish. Okay, so let's let's get going. Um, all right, so talk a little bit about Green Flag, and I've, I've put up three aims of more or less what we're doing. And um, more importantly, um, we're looking at the potential for airborne viruses to accumulate to infectious levels within an enclosed space. So the concept here is well. Let me just carry on reading quickly, and uh, we also want to prevent these, uh, you know, super spreading events and um, hotspots. And we want to prevent those from being repeat venues. So, you know, we've got all this contact, contact tracing efforts going on. But what I see is we have a big problem is that these super spreading events occur within a venue. And contact tracing don't really go and look at where the event occurred and then the space in which it occurred. So it can happen again and again, and it gets repeated. So through each wave, um, it may be different people, but we're going into the same venue or the same space and, and uh, with the potential of, of becoming another hotspot. And then what we want to do is, is inform everybody, you know, the public and managers and, and everybody how to reduce the risk. All right, so over the last, how, let's say 18 months, there's been a lot of research going on. And um, us at the Green Flag Association, we have a panel of experts comprising of doctors, scientists, and specialists um, from various disciplines, um, they're both locally and, and internationally. And we've been looking at the science, analyzing it, and, and, and seeing how, how it evolves during the pro progression of the COVID pandemic. Um, it's a multidisciplinary approach, which, which, which I think is a fundamental difference from, from what all the medical practitioners and, and, and doctors on the um, committees, uh, we, we bring a slightly different perspective. Um, but, um, you know, what we're seeing is that we can't rely solely on, 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 on vaccinations to reduce the spread, um, you know, because it's not just coronavirus, uh, there's, there's the variants, there's TB, common colds, influenza, whooping cough, measles, chicken pox, and these are all fairly common in, in South Africa. So there's a, a lot to be said about the uh, um, ventilation. So let me just go on to the next slide. And, and, and this is just one slide I put up of, of the research. Now, the, the important thing here is that they're saying airborne transmission, that is now considered the dominant route and that's via droplets and aerosol. And, 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 and the emergence of the Delta variant, well, that just, um, you know, it reinforces everything. So April, May, 2021, even the World Health Organization and CDC eventually came along and, and um, are stating that yes, it's airborne, but not enough emphasis has been put on that airborne transmission. So we, we're taking it to where it needs to be. So fortunately on Sunday, our president gave his speech. Now, the message became somewhat diluted because he's talking about COVID, but he's also had to speak about the unrest in KZN and everything else that's going on in the government. But if I bring you back into the focus of, of what he actually said, um, he said, infections are being driven by the Delta variant, which is far more transmissible than, previously, than the previous variant. So that's one main thing he said. Then he also said, um, now more than ever, we need to adhere to the, the basic precautions. So he's talking about the, the public, in public um, primary health care interventions that, that Green Flag has, has been talking about. 
Um, and he said that we know that indoor gatherings, particularly with poor ventilation, are the major cause of outbreaks and super spreader events. And we need to always ensure that windows are open and that there is a constant flow of fresh air. So what does that mean? I mean, why is this so important? And, and coming from the president, well, it basically changes everything. It changes the, the priority and the messaging put out by governments, leading authorities and other organizations. And, and, and it's, it's, it's in line with what we've been trying to do as, as Green Flag. And now with the acceptance of airborne transmission, um, the role of ventilation becomes extremely important, particularly if you have to do risk assessments in terms of the COVID uh, uh, direction that was put out for the Department of Labor, if that applies to you. But nevertheless, um, whether you're doing a risk assessment or just looking at the ventilation itself in your own facility, in your own areas, then uh, that is uh, one of the most important um, determinants of whether you're going to um, uh, catch COVID or not. All right, so brief, briefly, um, and, and these are the couple of slides that have been presented in the past, just, just to remind you that, you know, when we breathe, we breathe out um, aerosols, which are less than 100 microns in, in diameter, and they can remain suspended in hours. And, and also when we speak, we're pushing out part, uh, part, uh, droplets. All right, so these droplets get thrown out ballistically, and... Um, they fall to the ground, which I'll show you in the, in the next few, few slides pretty quickly. Um, but they're about 300 microns um, and larger. And, and the thing is with these droplets, they can actually, when they break open, they, they, they can burst into smaller particles and also remain airborne for a longer period. So, so the, the original thought from the CDC and World Health Organization is that they were thinking that, that, that it's these larger droplets that are the main concern. Um, and and but, the, but what the scientists are saying, it's, it's actually sort of difficult to get one of those droplets to land, unless you're really close to someone who's very infected, to actually land on a mucous membrane. And that would be in your mouth, your nose, your eyes. Um, whereas if you look at the aerosols, it's far more likely that you're going to inhale that into your lungs. And, and that's when it becomes a lot more infective. There's a lot more of it in the air, and it's, it's penetrating into a place where, it, where you, you're more likely to be infected, and that's in your lungs. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so this, this study was done. Um, I've got the link at the bottom. And first of all, so there's four slides like this. We'll first look at the 320 micron sized particles that, that are, are coming out of your mouth when you breathe and speak. And if you look on the right hand side, you'll see the time scale. The time scale in, in, in blue is in the first very few seconds going up to 20 seconds. In, in when it gets to about pink. So you'll see a lot of the larger particles are falling to the ground where you see those pinks and greens. And, and that's sort of the area around that. So, so keep in mind that those are the larger, what we would call droplets. Then we go smaller in size. Um, and you look at those particles that they, they fall away also under gravity, but they move with the airflow around the body and, and, and a lot of them will collide and, and, and or some of the larger ones can collide and adhere to the body as well. But you need to now imagine this picture, you know, with the first one that I showed you it combined. I mean, that's what you're seeing. And then if I go to the next, the third one, you'll see down to 20 microns. So now this is more within your breath and your breathing. And they will small, you know, fall slowly under gravity, but they're mainly transported by, uh, to the ceiling um, by buoyancy. So your body heat in, in, a, in, a, in a still room where there's very little airflow, the, the heat from your body is rising up and it's transporting these particles. And as you can see, they're moving forward about two to three meters away and um, starting to hit the wall on the other side. And if I go to the last one, the fourth one, these are the five micron size particles, and these are easily transferred around. And if you look at the speed at which they actually move, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, within 20 seconds, it's gone from where, from the body up and then over and then almost bouncing down to the wall on the other side. Now, these are easily picked up by ventilation systems and can be moved around the room. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, it, enough time and in enough, enough of those particles inhaled uh, you, you, your risk of, of infection are, is significantly increased. So you imagine those four pictures that I showed you all combined into one. 
there's a hell of a lot of emissions that can come from an in infected person. But the point of these slides is to sh just show you how, how quickly these very fine particles can move away. And this is just um, possibly breathing, not even uh, shouting or speaking, uh, uh, that, but I'll talk about that just now. All right, so let's get back to ventilation. So what is ventilation? And this is an important definition. It's a process of providing outdoor fresh air to occupants within a building and removing stale air that may be contaminated. So in the true sense, when we talk about ventilation, we're talking about bringing air from the outside into the room, not, not just recirculating that air. So the recirculation of air using a split unit air conditioner or fans, that is not ventilation. Ventilation is taking the old, get, bringing in the clean, fresh air and removing the old air. All right, and it, and it is widely recognized as a key mechanism for controlling transmission. So there's three ways that we look at that how ventilation is provided. You can, it's either mechanically, because there's obviously a lot of places that don't have um, access to, to natural ventilation through doors and windows. So they'll use uh, central air conditioning units, HVACs, uh, also known as HVACs, uh, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning. But in KZN, we, we don't really need heating that much, although this winter has been a bit cold, but generally it's, it's more, we call them central air conditioning systems be, because of the, the less requirement for um, heating. And then you get a combination of the two. You know, often you'll have a place with a central system and natural ventilation. Um, and then airflow. So, so first of all, I've defined ventilation. Now I'm defining airflow. So airflow is slightly different in a sense that we're just talking about the way the air moves through a space. Um, we, we're trying to see if the air is, is it recirculating? What's happening with the rebreathed air? Is, is the flow through in, or in the, in the area, is it turbulent? Or are there stale, stagnant areas in a, in a corner somewhere where there's no ventilation? So we're just looking at the flow. Of, of air when we talk about airflow. So what I've been teaching uh, my students uh, when, when they go out and look um, uh, at, at, at places, public spaces, and, and, and how to assess their ventilation, the first, first thing we're gonna do is look, look for all the natural openings. Where are the windows in this space? If you're a facilities uh, manager or, or in, in charge of a, of, of a room or a venue, that's what you're going to do. You're going to look for all your natural openings, windows, doors, vents, but I'll go into a little bit more detail just now. And then also look at the mechanical systems uh, if they've got that. And that can be anything from, from supply and extraction fans, pedestal fans, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, just to give you an example, what, what I do, Okay, so I just did a quick sketch. If you look at the one on the left, um, I, I drew in, this was of a restaurant. I just drew in the windows and I drew the direction of airflow. Uh, the door, you can see where the door is, uh, the dividing walls. And, and I was just with the use of a smoke tube. So now I have the luxury of, of using air current tubes or smoke tubes as we call them. You can buy them from Draeger or other similar type companies. and I'm not sure of the price. I think it's about 800 or 900 Rand for a box of 10 tubes. And they're about the size of a pencil. You break off the tips and you can blow smoke out of them. Um, and you can use that smoke. And it's not a lot of smoke. It's, it's, it's a little bit more than a cigarette, but less than, a, say, a smoke bomb. And with that smoke, I'm looking at how the air is flowing through the building. If you, if you don't have that, I think I've, I've heard of guys using um, you know, these children's smoke bubble. Uh, you know, to blow bubbles. Um, they have these guns. So the smaller the bubbles, the better, and the more of them, you release them, and you can just watch the flow of bubbles, just keep releasing them, and then follow it and trace it onto your drawing. Um, so if you look on the left, you'll see uh, what I picked up, that the airflow, a lot of the airflow was coming in through the door, and that's primarily because of the pressure on the building, the wind, the wind was blowing from there. But it, you know, and, and it was flowing down the passage towards the, the kitchen and the toilets. I couldn't really fit it in the drawing. So so I added the kitchen underneath and I could see in the kitchen, the reason why the air was going in that direction, they, have a, they had a massive extraction hood. So obviously that was pulling the air out of the kitchen. Now that air needs to be replaced. Um, otherwise it creates a bit of a vacuum. So it's pulling the air from, from the passageway. The same with the toilets, two little expel air fans in the, in the toilets. It was also pulling air from the passageway. So it's so handy to have a little bit of smoke. That's all you need or, or the air bubbles. And you can actually determine 
what is what is the air doing in your environment in in your facility the one on the right was the same i, I depicted the uh, illustrated the the diffusers now <laughs> i'm going to use terminology uh, which I think would be handy for you guys to, to remember. Um, I'll talk about them a bit more, but diffusers are typically round um, from the ceiling and that's where the air conditioned air comes out of if you've got a central air conditioning system or HVAC as it's called. That's where it comes out. So we call them diffusers because they diffuse the air into the, into the area. And then you're gonna have a return air and that's more like a grate. I've got pictures to show you, it's a, it's a grid. And that's where the air goes back into the system. So. A lot of these systems are recirculating air, but I've drawn it like that. I could see the airflow and um, that with uh, carbon dioxide measurements, I could, I could, have, I could uh, determine, Sean will speak uh, um, after Greg um, on, on carbon dioxide, but I'm just gonna lay down the basics in my presentation. All right, so, so talking about those terminologies, passive vents, I'll, I'll show you what passive vents are, air movement fans, supply and extract fans, split unit aircon and the HVAC or central aircon system system. So a lot of pictures coming up. So you can just verify and, and have a look. So passive vents. So there's no, we call them passive because there's no mechanical extraction. Um, the air flows in depending on the wind or the pressures in the building. Um, the compromise that we're having to take for COVID will be temperature and possibly noise as well. Because if, we, if we're trying to put fresh air into the building, that's what we're gonna to have to put up with is, is a bit of noise and, and also your air con systems aren't gonna work as effectively. You can still use them, but they're not gonna be as effective because you're bringing air from the outside. But nevertheless, during lockdown periods, highly recommend that we get as much air into the room as possible so that the concentrations don't pick up there. And, and this is quite easy, desk fans, pedestal fans and ceiling fans. That's what they look like. Just really just move the air around. Not ideal, but there are ways that you can use them to your advantage. And then when I talk about supply and extraction fans, these are the ones that you see built into walls and ceilings. If it's, if it's providing air into the room, we call it a supply. And if it's pulling the air out of a room, we call it extraction fan. And an interesting one here is, is the use I'm sure you've all seen it in public toilets and uh, even at work in your office toilets, they've got little, uh, we, we have a brand called Expelair fans, very small um, to remove odors, but we find them to be extremely effective because the area that they've been installed into, like your bathrooms, are, 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 the volume of that area is pretty small, it's pretty low, so they're quite effective. So as soon as you open a door, uh, the replacement air coming in moves towards that little extraction fan. So while we're speaking of um, bathrooms and toilets, I, I found this picture. So this is, and we, we <laughs> research has shown that it's significant that COVID is transmitted from flushing. It's in feces. And if you flush a toilet, uh, you can see the distance after, uh, you know, 1.4 meters to the side, 1.3 meters to the front. And, and this is after five, uh, well, less than five seconds of flushing. Um, and what disturbed me a bit was, I mean, I've got two 13 year old boys and sometimes they forget to flush. I'll walk in there and flush the toilet. And I look at that figure that says up to 0 0.8 meters in height. And I'm standing over, I'm gonna flush, um, yeah, a bit unpleasant. So the, the, the main thing you've got to do here is in, in your facilities, make sure the lid is down. If you have to flush the toilet, just put the lid down, flush it and just, just get out of there. Hopefully everybody flushes after they've been, but yeah, just thought it would be interesting that this is a significant issue. Here is the extraction hood that I talked about earlier. Uh, they usually have quite a strong extraction fan, so it's going to pull a lot of air out of this kitchen, and that air has to be replaced. It will come in through windows, down the passage, through the door, um, and that will give you a hint of what, what the air is doing in your place. Um, a, a sort of a side diagram of, of what these hoods look like. Um, in this case, if you look in the blue, what's interesting is they put the makeup air intake separate. So, so it's not gonna pull air, it's gonna pull it in through the ceiling, through the roof, if, if you've got closed windows or doors or the area is pretty enclosed, you, you're gonna to have to allow somewhere for the replacement air to come in. Robert, you've been right. going just under 20. 
Oh, okay. I'll try and speed up. Um, okay. what, what time am I at now? I'll well, give you, let's do five minutes. All right. Okay, split unit aircon. Just remember these units are very common. They do not, they just recirculate the air. It's more energy efficient, so they don't filter it or anything. They take the air that's in the room, and if it's full of COVID, it'll just recirculate it and blow it onto everybody else. There's another picture of it, Common, commonly used. I have, we have them in our homes. Um, there's one that's ceiling mounted, um, usually in the middle of the room, but also it's a split unit. It's not part of the uh, central air conditioning system. And there's the old window shaker or through, through window, through wall units. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, it's important that if it doesn't supply fresh air from outside, we can't call it a ventilation system. And, and this is the a brief diagram of how, it, how an air conditioning system works, takes the warm air, puts it through a fairly meager filter, nothing, nothing that's gonna, it's just really for flies and bugs and things, you know, COVID will go straight through that. And the fan blows it over the cooling coils and then back into the room. So this picture is, is, is now how a HVAC or a, a, a ventilation system works. If you look at figures one and three, that's inside the room and figures two, four, and five are all outside. And what it does, it pulls the air from the room at number one. Um, you'll see it goes through a, a valve or a, uh, what else do you call them, a flange to control the airflow. And, and also it'll draw air from point number two, which is outside the fresh air. So now, as soon as you start doing that, you're calling it a ventilation system. So you'd wanna keep that flange. If you have these systems, you wanna keep number two open so that as much fresh air can get pulled into the room as possible. All right, so, so that's the fundamental working of that. And that's what they look like in, inside without the ceiling. It's just a lot of ducting. Um, your, your diffuser outlets, which I spoke about, they can be square or round. And then on the right-hand side are your return air grills. So the, so the air that's going back to the system, it's either through the ceiling or in the bulkhead in the wall. And in a typical office, if you look at this one, there's a we have a combination. So you've got your split, your square split unit in the middle, which is just recirculating air, and then we have a part of a diffuser from the um, main air circulation system, ventilation system. Let's call it. Uh, but you, what you need to check for are the intakes. Now I got this from a, another presentation, Monona Rosol, which I, I saw earlier today. Those intakes they they're not in the ideal place. There's, there's rubbish there. The, the vehicle, it looks like a loading bay. So if a vehicle reser reverses into there, you're gonna start pulling in the exhaust emissions into your system and then into, into the, the rooms. The same with the roof. If you have um, intakes on the roof, go and check where your intakes are. Because um, if you look at the smaller pipes, those are from the, the toilets, the, you know, the, the, the air relief valves in the toilets actually exit on the roof. And now you're gonna pull them into the intakes of your HVAC system. So, so check for that. Um, this is ideal restaurant situation, nice open, open windows and doors and, and a lot of fresh air. So it's unlikely the virus is gonna to accumulate to high levels. Um, and remember this, I'm almost done. I've got about two or three more slides. This was the, the old early days. Wash your hands, uh, cough into your, sleeve and avoid contact and and we're doing things like over sanitizing and putting up screens on your desks which don't don't work they just interfere with the ventilation um, a bank perhaps because now you're behind a screen so those are proper screens where they go from the desk right up to the top but these small desk screens in fact probably make the situation worse because you, you're not allowing proper airflow so then in terms of the green flag if we look at all that messaging that a lot of it's still going around we're saying, if you look at our top five, we're saying vaccinate. First of all, vaccinate, that's the most important. Secondly, look at your ventilation, do things uh, that I told you to look for with smoke tubes and soap bubbles, easy to do. And, and it will make such a huge difference just looking at the airflow, making sure that, that it's not, um, stale air is not accumulating. Third, of course, masking is a very good protection measure. And then look at the vocalizations. If you've got a choir or a band or someone singing, the amount of aerosols that you're going to emit are so much more higher, orders of magnitude. So from, from, from breathing 
to speaking is an increase and then for speaking to shouting or singing is even higher. You're going to release a lot of virus into the air if you're infected. And then finally, social distancing. Okay, and that's pretty much it from my side. Hopefully I was around about the 20 minute mark um, or just over. And um, I'll hand over to Greg, uh, Dr. Greg Q. He will do the next presentation on um, the use of UV UVC. UVC. Okay. Good Thanks, stuff. Greg. Thank you. Greg, you just over to you. Thanks so much. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Let me just confirm it's it's there. And uh, the right mode. Okay, Greg, we can't hear you. Let me just check to see why. No, can't hear you. Okay, I'm no longer on mute. Can you see? You, you just you just very uh, down, right? Okay. No, I, I, I mean, am I, is my so, voice speaking back? softly. <laughs> is my voice there again? Yes, yes. You're, we can hear you now. Okay, gosh, I don't know what happened. Okay, I'm back and I shall share my screen again. And there. Yeah. Are we good? We good. Uh, okay, sorry about the voice. Okay. Use okay. The That's cool. it. There yeah. So super. Let's get cracking. Um, these are sort of the frequently asked questions that I want to talk about. Um, and uh, I'll get through them as fast as I can. I'm hoping that, that I'll address your questions essentially before you need to ask them. One of the questions I'm often asked is, what is this UVA, BC stuff? What does it actually even mean? Um, is it anything to do with my sun, sunburn uh, cream that I have to use? Um, is it the same stuff we're talking about? And how does it disinfect anyway? And how effective is it? And does it work for SARS? Is it safe? And how do we use it? How is it applied in, uh, in buildings and, and workplace settings perhaps? And are there any limitations of use? So let's um, have a look at what ultraviolet light is about, um, ultraviolet radiation. Radiation is simply energy that moves in the form of waves and light is a form of that radiation, so sunlight is a form of radiation and it's just basically the light that gives us the ability to see things um, on earth and light waves um, that we see are called visible light and you'll see that it's part of a spectrum so visible light is made up of waves of varying wavelength uh, which give us colors so all these colors these blues and reds and yellows and pinks and these beautiful things we're seeing are different wavelengths that we perceive as colors uh, when we look at visible light, but visible light is not the total story. Uh, radiation waves also occur in nature in other forms of visible light. Uh, and these are also determined by their wavelengths. So from narrow wavelengths like, like here, um, sorry, over here, which are X-rays and gamma rays, these are very narrow. You can see this is a narrow wavelength. And over this end here, very wide wavelength, which is radio waves and microwaves and the bits in between. Visible light is just this little bit here. And ultraviolet light is the section just next to visible light. So where visible light goes from blue indigo violet, visible violet into ultraviolet. And on this end here, it goes down to red and then becomes infrared, infra becoming invisible red ultra becoming unbelievable and invisible violet. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. I'm going to just shrink this. So this uh, points out that this UVC, UVA, UVB comes from spectral bands that split the ultraviolet segment of the spectrum of radiation. So there's visible, there's red becoming infrared, there's our violet, visible violet becoming ultraviolet. And ultraviolet has these three segments. Uh, of slightly longer waves, medium waves, and shorter waves. And this was way back in the 1930s already, where that's, those segments were, were classified. And later on, they, were, they added a fourth one called vacuum UV, which is not for today. So this UVA 
uh, which is sometimes called black light because it's the invisible part of the purple or, vis or, or, or um, ultraviolet. Um, UVA blends into UVB and UVA is what causes skin aging. When you're lying at the pool of the beach and you get a wrinkled skin, it's the UVA that's doing it. It also causes skin cancer, but not as much as UVB. UVB is the bad one. Uh, that causes cancer, causes cataracts, and it's part of this what we call actinic radiation because it causes chemical reactions, and it's these chemical reactions in our skin, in our eyes, that cause this the, the damage. So A and B, they're the ones that cause human health issues um, through sunlight exposure. Once you move out to the shorter wavelengths, below 280, you enter into UVC, but this is completely absorbed by Earth's atmosphere. It doesn't get to us. So UVC that we experience is actually all generated by us making UVC for given purposes. And we typically use it for germicidal radiation, germicidal killing of germs. Germicidal radiation is this UVC. And it further has a spectrum of a longer wave to a very shorter wave. Uh, from sort of the 280 to the 200 nanometers. And this is important for today's discussion because these longer UVC waves, uh, pretty much yeah, 254 nanometers, are where most germicidal radiation devices function. And, uh, but you can see 254 is sort of close-ish to this UVB, so it makes one a little nervous. Uh, but the moment you start going down here to the 200, 220, that's far UVC. It's now further away from this dangerous end. And we'll talk about the implications of that in a minute. So this UVC is where the germicidal band is. And it's the area of interest for today's talk. Um, and the most common bandwidth that's used by devices that you'll encounter are these at 254 nanometers or otherwise known as near UVC. And the shorter wavelengths on the far left here are called far UVC and they're much safer because they do not penetrate the outer layers of the skin. They don't even penetrate the liquid covering your eyes, uh, but they're still germicide. Um, the energy content, this is stuff that you'll probably encounter when you read the material. You'll see these terms millijoules per centimeter square. That's just the dose, the energy content of the light. And it's important to know that because the units of, of maximum exposure are often expressed as a millijoules per centimeter squared. So maximum exposure in, in your building or your workplace will be expressed as this. And then when you're buying equipment, it will be expressed as intensity of the energy delivered and you'll see that in milliwatts. And essentially it's just a conversion from, from joules to joules per second. So the fact that it's now joules at a rate per second gives you the intensity of the energy delivered by the globe that you are uh, buying in your piece of equipment. So how does it disinfect? Well, the UV light at 254 damages the microorganism's uh, genetic material, damages uh, the material that it gets to. Um, this is essentially what's going on with UVB as well, of course, but UVC doesn't penetrate as much as UVB, um, and it, but it certainly gets to bacterium and viruses and small organisms, and it causes disruption of the material, the genetic material, and therefore they become neutralized. It doesn't fry them or burn them or cook them. It just damages their DNA and they can't replicate. This one, UVC far, um, it damages these surface proteins that are part of the picture of SARS. These, yes, yeah, SARS uh, uh, virus, yeah, these surface proteins, they're the ones that the virus uses to, to link onto our cells and penetrate into our cells. So if those are damaged uh, by the UV light, these floating viruses can't actually access the human cell and they become neutralized. So <clears throat> um, how effective is UVC? It's very effective, very effective. Um, but note, uh, UVA and UVB are not effective at killing organisms. UVC is. Um, in fact, it's been known for a long time. This guy won the Nobel Prize way back in 1903, discovering that UV kills germs, 1903. 1942, the chap Wells published research showing that measles was massively reduced when the schools use these UV um, uh, devices way back in 1942. 46, the chap uh, Matthew Lukish in America published a monograph on its use. So it's been around a long time. And despite this proven efficacy, it's remained unpopular 
because it was eclipsed by the discovery of antibiotics. During this time, the 40s is when antibiotics were discovered, and oh, we don't need this stuff. And then after all, there's a possibility that it causes cancer. So let's stay with antibiotics. And so it basically didn't gain popularity. All. But in, 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 notwithstanding that, many studies have been done demonstrating its effectiveness in healthcare settings. And much of that work was done in this country by the CSIR against tuberculosis in healthcare settings. Very effective. And so many UVC installations have been put into public health clinics across the country. The effectiveness of UVC and UVC near and far against SARS-CoV-2 has also been reduced and researched and published. And in fact, the kill dose has been published of about three to 10.6 millijoules per centimeter squared. Uh, this guy, Buanono, uh, is a great advocate of UVC and uh, he's published work in Nature using a lab setting with aerosol, aerosolized human coronavirus and showed that it is effective and safe. It's, it's got these kill rates over a particular period of time, concluded it's effective for SARS-CoV-2. And the safety, of course, has been, I've mentioned here already, because it doesn't penetrate into the skin or into the eye. So he is so confident about UVC, he believes that these devices should be installed into public health settings as permanent continuous applications, not just uh, when no <clears throat> nobody's in the room. Uh, so this is still early. Everyone's a little nervous of this idea at this time, bathing everybody in UVC light in public settings. But he's made the point that it's actually quite safe to do so. Um, so <clears throat> what are the health and safety concerns? Uh, so direct exposure of this UVC 254 can cause an um, eye injury, a lot like arc eye that welders experience. Uh, so it can cause sort of this painful eye injury and cause basically sunburn effect on the skin, uh, but doesn't cause cancer. It causes these burns, arc eyes and skin, uh, skin reactions. This far UVC I've pointed out is safe because it doesn't even penetrate beyond uh, the, the liquid film over the eye. Uh, UVC lamps can generate ozone, and ozone is an irritant, but this can be avoided by using titanium doped quartz glass devices. So they're slightly more expensive, but they prevent this ozone problem, which can be irritating to the airways, irritating the eyes. So it may make people think they've been exposed to that, when in fact it's ozone. Um, so get proper titanium doped quartz glass devices. UVC lamps can sometimes call, uh, contain mercury. I'll discuss that with you in a moment. So if they've got mercury in them, clearly you need to be care careful if they break uh, or um, in, in general maintenance. Having them on all the time, UVC can uh, degrade certain uh, materials such as plastics, polymers. And the, the risk of cancer really relates to a, a purchasing of a device that has contaminated presence of UVB light. So these UVC devices, uh, some of the cheaper ones might have a sneaky bit of UVB coming in, and that in fact might uh, uh, be the reason why some concerns of cancer have been expressed. Safety related to UVC depends on the wavelength, in other words, whether it's 254 or 222, I've made that clear, and the dose. In other words, intensity and duration, the longer and the more intense the exposure, the higher the likelihood you're gonna have an adverse effect. And there are published exposure limits, which um, you need, just need to be aware of. So these types of device, the most common one is this mercury lamp, uh, and most of its emissions are in the far UVC range. They're the least expensive, but of course they have the mercury concern. The eczema lamps are the ones that produce this far UVC, uh, and uh, they're more expensive, but they produce this, the safer version of UVC. Pulse denon lamps are uh, broadband spectrum devices, typically used in facilities where there are no people, so in operating theaters and ICUs, et cetera, when there's no one there, they blast the place with UVC and then uh, clear it for, for, uh, for people to re-enter. And these LEDs I have not encountered. Uh, I, I've just read about them. You can, they can become, uh, deliver very narrow wave, wavelength bands. So I suppose you could set it very nicely to 220 or 250 or whatever. Um, I haven't encountered them personally, but I know they're out there. So how they applied, you can bathe the entire room with UVC. So typically in unoccupied spaces, such as operating theaters, as I mentioned, uh, airplanes where people have left, bathe it in UVC, allow the people to re-enter, uh, or occupied spaces, but then you'd be using far UVC, and that's what I mentioned earlier. It's You're closing early. off, Greg. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. targeted radiation. Uh, here is... Um, where you're now using an upper room UVGI. So this is where the device is at the top here. 
and uh, it's it's bl blasting UV above people and with slow moving air moving around the room you move that aerosolized breath up into that space where it can be permanently installed and remove aerosol so that's the most common form perhaps of UVGI you can install it in the building ducting like this the beauty of this is that no one's exposed you can blast that air uh, that's coming through and clear it of aerosol you can put it in sterilizing cabinets and then there are these purifiers, these in, uh, air cleaners that, that you'll read about and perhaps people have been trying to sell you. The limitations of use are that you need direct line of sight, so you've got to be caution, cautious of, of shadows. You need adequate contact time and intensity, so make sure the installation is right. You must be aware of, of dust. It, the rays cannot penetrate through dust, so maintenance is important. Um, the intensity drops over time, so these globes need to be replaced, so maintenance schedule is important. It also drops over distance, so again, correct installation. Um, and there are safe uh, health and safety concerns about things like ozone and eye burns, as I talked about. So again, the quality of the equipment and installation. So you see I've highlighted essentially two important things, the equipment and the maintenance would make uh, these limitations less of a concern. So note, when you install this in the ducting, I've been asked this before, if you install this in the ducting, it doesn't reduce the exposure in the room. So the people that are talking, singing, and chatting in the room, they're still going to be exposed to the virus they're generating. It's only the air that's removed from the room that is cleared by the, in, the, 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 the installation in the ducting. So that's the limitation of putting in the ducting. You'll still need decent ventilation in order to clear the aerosol that's in the room where the people are moving around and talking and breathing. Uh, and these UV air purifiers can be misleadingly marketed, beware. They do kill virus, but their ability to clear the real world room is limited because of their small fans. So they'll tell you that, uh, you know, for this device, you, you can clear a room of that size. And these are in laboratory settings, not in real world settings. Um, so you need to get a lot of these uh, to achieve the adequate dis uh, the disinfection because of their small fans. Mm -hmm. One way around that is to ask for an independently certified clean air delivery rate, CADR. That clean air delivery rate will tell you the actual delivery of that device and its ability to clear a room in a real world setting. So in conclusion, UVGI is effective. It neutralizes all biological agents. That's so good for influenza, TB, and SARS-CoV-2, uh, but it must be installed and maintained correctly. Uh, it does not replace ventilation as a control. It simply supplements it. It's relatively inexpensive and can save money by reducing your ventilation demand. So if you need certain air changes per hour in order to achieve adequate ventilation, if you supplement it with uh, UVGI, you can get away with slightly lower by way of ventilation in order to achieve the same level of air clearance. That's it. If, uh, I've included some references and I'll be happy to share this slide with uh, John. Um, uh, it's, sorry, this presentation is John, if you uh, find it helpful. That's me. Thank you. Yes, th Greg, thank you very much. Just before Sean comes in, uh, we if we can get the presentations and we will put them up on our web. I think some of the stuff you got here is uh, very useful to the guys practicing. Sean, um, we're going to cut you short. You've got 12 minutes um, on uh, CO2, please. and green flag uh, certification, which is about ventilation and why. There we go. All right, good. You can hear me, you can see me. Hello, we folks. Can hear, we can hear you and see you and we're chasing you on time, sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem at all. Uh, there we go. Okay, so carbon dioxide, as an indicator gas, is the canary in the coal mine, really. I mean, in the old days, we had to put the canary in the cage, but these days, to measure carbon dioxide, which we use as an instrument, and it measures uh, your ventilation rate. It's a rapid test of being able to test your, your ventilation within an occupied space. So there's all these compl complicated calculations, but there's a lot of scientific evidence that's that, that the measurement of CO2 is accurately used uh, as, as an indication of ventilation rate. Lots of countries are starting to adopt this. Remember, this is a very new technology. It's a, a lot of it has come out of COVID. 
um, in terms of the space and the COVID control system, but we know that the USA is using it, Australia is putting it in Denmark, Germany, Norway, Slovenia. South Africa is busy looking at uh, implementing into the national building regulations. European is things and this, if you had to check the same list uh, in a week's time, you'll probably find another one will be added to it. So very much uh, gaining a lot of momentum, uh, the use of carbon dioxide inside occupied spaces through various applications. Um, so what we do, there are different limits that we use. And uh, so what we use, uh, there's limits in the US and Australia, so they're recommending 600 parts per million. In the US, it's around about uh, 1,100, 1,200 parts per million. The irony is, is that at 1,200 parts per million, you start getting other impacts like uh, decision-making uh, impacts and all that stuff. Thing. So at the Green Flag Association, we use what is becoming the international norm is around 800 parts per million, which equates roughly to about 15 liters per second. Um, uh, per person or around about 12 air changes per hour. Uh, then you know that if you start getting above your 1,400 parts per million, really becomes a massive issue. Uh, we, we you'd actually start getting proper, proper um, other uh, health effects as well as fatigue, as well as decision making as well. But we know that at 1,400 parts per million, I can guarantee you, if you don't have an instrument, you do not know what your CO2 concentrations are. And you probably, if you're sitting in an unventilated office or if you've got a split unit air conditioner and you've got two or three people in your office, I can guarantee you that that environment is greater than 1,400 parts per million. And so your risk of uh, COVID is actually pretty high. So we know that at about 2,000 ppm, really, it creates the ventilation of about less than two liters per person. And it gives you a 100% relative risk. So at about 2,000 parts per million, which again is not unusual, um, and so you'd actually find that if you've got four people inside that area, one person's a contact case is carrying the virus, a pre-symptomatic and shedding virus, they'd be able to go in there and all four people would walk out positive after just an hour or so. This is a, an example of how we can use ventilation inside a, a car. Uh, very typical when we measure these concentrations pretty often inside vehicles um, and, and in taxi buses and that we've done lots of work in that and you can quite easily get to 3,500 3, parts per million. It's important to note that we've actually measured uh, up to 5,000 but then we actually open up the windows before it gets even higher but they have measured 15,000 parts per million inside taxis in London and at that point where you start getting to right over what is actually even safe in terms of somebody having to operate a machine like that. If you think about taxis operating on our roadways, uh, we are, this is definitely another knock-on impact of carbon dioxide. But if you actually open both your windows, you're getting about nine air changes per minute, and you're bringing those concentrations well below uh, what is actually the, the issue. Um, so at 624 parts per million, we've got a very, very low risk. There's still proximity risks. So things like masks and sanitization of the surface that would still be important. But you can relate this kind of idea to what your office space is and what Rob was speaking about the introduction of fresh air. Uh, just very important to note as well that the carbon dioxide is actually very impactful on hu human and decision-making performance. There's been lots of studies. I've been following the carbon dioxide uh, um, scenario, story, and narratives for a few years now. And uh, since about 2011, we started getting studies coming out around carbon dioxide and, uh, and performance, where you'd actually find that about 600 parts per million you, quite, you, you get a much higher score, and, and, and certainly when you start getting to those very high concentrations, which are not that untypical, atypical inside offices, you start getting very poor making decisions. So you start relating that to economic impacts of having poor ventilation for your business and for your organization. There's also studies around absenteeism, productivity, et cetera, and they all kind of indicate exactly the same sort of thing. But uh, this is actually supposed to be 1,000 ppm, that 1,000 ppm is just this increased risk. Of, this, is, this is brand new, heart of the press, press, increased risk of inflammation, bone demineralization, kidney calcification, oxidative stress, and endothelial dysfunction. So, they, and this is, they're measuring concentrations while people are sleeping at night in their beds. Uh, you've got the windows closed, it's winter. Uh, you want to keep the dogs out, keep the dogs in, I don't know. Just think about those things. This is an actual result of what we monitored inside a taxi while we were busy doing some of the work. Uh, we closed the windows, very quickly peaked up to about 3000 ppm, and then we opened the windows and you can see it very quickly uh, dropped off again. 
This is the Green Flag Association Continuous Monitoring Platform. If anybody in this forum is very interested in this, we can absolutely come and install these devices inside your occupied spaces, your boardrooms, your canteens, your multi-use areas, all those sorts of things. This would be, would be handy. And as soon as the indoor air quality kind of gets to a point or the CO2 concentration gets to a point that there might be a danger area, we would send you a, a WhatsApp, an email or whatever it is that, that in terms of the platform uh, permissions that we do. And obviously we also get lots of other indoor air quality parameters that we that we able to report to you as well. And this is my last slide and this is the Green Flag Compliance. If you had to use the Green Flag Association, what we do is we obviously have expertise and instrumentation and experience. We come in and we evaluate that facility and issue us uh, issue you with certificates. John, thank you very much and thank you very much folks. That's very good. So um, a couple of quick questions. Um, a year ago, there was a lot of fogging that was being done um, to uh, prevent the transmission of um, uh, COVID. W what's our view on fogging? Greg. No, Sean, you've got to just say two words. <laughs> yeah, fogging, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. You're wasting your money. It's not indicated. It's uh, landing on surfaces. Surface can just be wiped with a normal rag. Uh, certainly your high, uh, uh, high risk surfaces or high contact surfaces. Greg? Just in addition, you're putting people at risk. Those foggers are highly irritant. They can cause asthma. They linger in the air sometimes. And certainly there was also a popular idea that you could put these devices in like a tunnel at the beginning uh, of the entrance of the workplace where people could walk through well. a fogging tunnel and be, de de you know, kind of be uh, uh, sanitized on the way in and on the way out. They do more harm than good. Okay, so there you have a quick answer on uh, fogging. I think that um, just we, we, we're getting to the end. Uh, there was a question as well. What about HEPAD filters in uh, the air conditioning system? HEPA filters uh, obviously do work they, as long as they're electrostatically charged, which they are, but you remember electrostatically charged filters only last about three months. So whatever your, your installation cost is, you have to recognize that as part of your ongoing maintenance costs, as well as the fact that they, um, they do put burdens onto your existing system, so you have to make sure that your, your fan motor and that can actually handle the extra pressure within the system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so the answer is HEPAD filters work, but you can't just put them in because you, you, you actually need to design them in as part yes, of the correct. function. So, I mean, what we're coming back to is uh, fresh air, fresh air, fresh air in and yeah. good ventilation. And, and ventilation. At, <laughs> and ventilation and look yeah. at your airflow as to how it's doing uh, and how it's impacting people i think the uh, the diagrams that robert put up and we will uh, put that presentation up where the uh, aerosol tends to rise to the ceiling you then put your diffuser there and push it all down again um so we we probably haven't uh, resolved that um resolved that particular issue so um, I think that this stage, we're two minutes off, um, off completion. Thank you very much to the panel. Uh, John, sorry, um, um, Greg would like to just add something, if that's okay. Sorry about yes, the interruption. Greg. Thanks, John. Thanks, thanks, Sean. I just wanted to add to what Sean mentioned. I, I think yeah. uh, it is worthy for the audience to make the point that uh, HEPA filters work as they do, but in the main, they're not necessary. Um, you can get away with a lesser filter uh, and achieve probably better <clears throat> than uh, putting the filter in and a HEPA filter in, which is going to give you difficulties. The Sean made the point that you you, you put the HEPA filter in, you've got an increased maintenance requirement. It plug, clogs up uh, more quickly, and your 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 fans need to be much more powerful. So so you don't have to go to HEPA it's, uh, in the last minute. I thought I want to make that point. You can install slightly less than HEPA. Um, yeah, just but, contact uh, us then, yeah, yeah. for sure. Contact yeah. us and work with us and we'll, we'll give you all the advice you need. So thanks, Greg. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. And, and Sean, thank you very much to you and to Green Flag and to um, Dr. Greg Q and to uh, Robert for coming on the, on the panel on this webinar and sharing your, uh, sharing your insights. I think this is the second one. Um, and we've uh, certainly, some of the feedback we've had already is they found it very interesting. Uh, I would like to get hold of the uh, presentations, please. We'll put them up on our web. 
I think some of the information you've got there is uh, invaluable. Uh, the diagrams and and um, and the slides that you've got providing information to the facilities management industry. So thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. To the participants, thanks for coming in. And um, and certainly um, we're as SAFMA very uh, very glad and happy to be associated with the Green Flag Association. I think this is a great initiative uh, that you're pushing forward and I think it's leading edge stuff. Um, and uh, and uh, all we can say to everyone is stay well, stay strong and stay away from the COVID. Thanks very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Greg. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sean, can I log off?